and thank you everyone for joining um, and uh, really appreciate getting to be here and, and uh, be with this community and support Spark, which is such an important effort in uh, in autism uh, and is really gonna, I think, help drive advances over the coming decades. Um, and so thank you all for participating in Spark as much as you can. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. So today we're gonna talk about psychiatric hospitalization um, for challenges with people, uh, for people with autism. And this primarily focuses on children and adolescents because that's where the uh, services tend to be as well uh, in terms of hospitalization and where the research has been. Um, and my intention is certainly to try to end with some time for questions available. So, So our agenda today, so we're going to talk briefly about autism and behavioral challenges. Then we will talk more extensively about psychiatric hospitalization. Uh, we'll do that generally, and then I'll tell you specifically about the specialized unit that we run at Spring Harbor Hospital as an example of this. Uh, and then we will talk about our inpatient research collaborative briefly, um, tell you about a study we did to try to improve care in non-specialized uh, psychiatric hospital units, um, and finally go over some consensus recommendations that were developed and then some resources for people, and then Q&A. So, uh, so starting with um, not the hospitalized population, but rather children with autism who are out in the community, what, what are the common problems or issues that arise? So this was a survey of parents um, through their schools. So these are not clinically referred kids. And this is what the parents uh, reported, about 500 kids. Um, and so the most common things, which is not gonna be a surprise to many of you, were these elements, which you might put in the ADHD kind of category of easy frustration, inattention, hyperactivity, uh, and then that was followed by less common, but but more getting uh, potentially more uh, serious issues of um, temper tantrums, 30%, irritability, fearful slash anxious. And then at the bottom, um, uh, what people often call serious uh, problem behaviors or challenging behaviors that you know present risk to the individual or others, including harming self, uh, which is self-injury, destroying property, physical aggression. So while these numbers at the bottom are not that high, five to 11%, um, I would propose those are high, right? Because this is a survey of just kids in the community. So this is not kids in an emergency room or kids in a, in a clinic. This is uh, just kids in the community have autism. So if five to 11% of just generally kids at one point in time in the community have these, you know, serious uh, uh, behaviors, um, that is a lot, I think, uh, and is concerning. Um, so a little more on these serious, you know, more serious challenging behaviors. So um, aggression. So when we say aggression, we mean physical aggression toward other people. We're not talking about verbal aggression. Um, uh, so this is, you know, hitting, kick, kicking, biting, et cetera. Um, so a couple studies that give us some information on this, uh, large studies. So the first one um, uh, asked uh, whether there was aggression toward the parent or toward non-parental caregivers. And the answers were, were very high, 68% and 49% uh, in that study. And then in a study that was done in, in a series of autism clinics, so that's a clinically referred population, so you would expect, <laughs> expect the numbers to be higher. Um, the, the number was quite high. Is the child currently demonstrating physical aggression? 53%. So that is quite high, although important to note that that was in a in in clinics, so it's a clinically referred population. But the takeaway is these are high numbers. Um, Self-injury, also high, not quite as high, but here was a survey um, that's done by the Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. Um, this is actually the thing that's repeated every two years and gives uh, produces that basic 
uh, number that many of us hear about, which is the the prevalence of autism. You know, so one in fifty four, one in forty five. That comes from this study, but they 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 ask other questions. They look at other things, and one of them is self injury. Um, it is a record review. They're not looking at children. They're looking at records of children. Um, but in that record review, uh, over a quarter um, had some evidence in the record of self injury. So that that is, I think, quite quite notable. And then in a different uh, study, um, which was a meta-analysis where you're pooling together a whole bunch of studies and looking at them, it was 42% with self-injury. Now those are studies and often you're studying kids who have the problem. So it's not a surprise that the, the number's a little higher, but the takeaway is self-injury also quite, quite prevalent. So something that I feel like I have come to appreciate over time and been educated by parents is, um, and I think it's quite remarkable, is that um, with regards to these serious challenging behaviors, whether it's aggression, self-injury, property destruction, that not infrequently families will say that it is this behavior that is a bigger problem than other things or than the autism itself or a bigger challenge uh, than the autism itself. And I think that that is just remarkable um, uh, that, that sometimes parents will, will say that. Um, and, and, and usually they will indicate, and these studies supported this um, to some degree, that uh, it's, it's, you know, the behavior itself is a big problem, but it's also the downstream effects because it isolates the family, increases stress, causes financial problems. And kind of ironically, the behavior itself can then prevent access to the very support we need, uh, you know, gets us potentially kicked out of our school program, or we can't see the doctor because we're aggressive in the, in the waiting room. And so um, that's a, a terrible irony, really. Um, another way that I think about this is uh, that that the problem with these behaviors be beyond the imminent risk and, and danger in the moment is um, what it can do for an individual over time in terms of preventing them from reaching their their developmental, whatever it is, their, their greatest kind of, kind of level. Um, so to illustrate this, I'm trying to show here that, um, so this, let's say for a particular individual, as they get older, this is their, their um, uh, maximum developmental trajectory. So this is kind of as well as they can function. And so uh, just to give one example of how this could play out um, to illustrate it. So here I've got a lighter blue line going along. So here we have a young child um, who with autism who's developing, you know, along their trajectory. Um, and then um, at four years old, they start to engage in self-injury and under, perhaps understandably in their preschool, which is not maybe a particularly specialized preschool, that's very distressing for everybody. And ultimately that child is asked to leave the preschool and is made to leave, which is which happens with some frequency. And so the problem then is that they start to fall off their developmental trajectory. They're not getting the supports, the interactions, the social communication that they normally would. And so potentially now we are losing ground in terms of our development. And it's because of this self-injury and not having access to other things. Um, and so that developmental trajectory potentially starts to bend downward. And then, so then we go along on this trajectory and then at seven years old, uh, let's say that, that this child's now bigger and the self-injury gets worse. And it's so distressing, uh, understandably, that the family feels like they can't take this child out into big public settings, the grocery store, uh, you know, an airplane, other, other things. And so that starts to also, you know, shrink the child's world. And so they, that bends their developmental trajectory potentially lower. Um, and then here we are at... Um, 11 years old and now aggression kicks in toward other people and you know something happens with a teacher or something and so then they get kicked out of their their you know fifth grade school program uh, or, or asked to not attend and and so you get my point that this is the sort of unspoken I think effect and problem of these these 
these behaviors um, and is is very concerning. Uh, and we've seen this happen a lot. And so, you know, potentially this person ends up not developing to their maximum potential, or maybe they have to do a big catch up. Um, so, uh, so let's talk about aggression and, and self-injury or these significant challenging behaviors. Um, so the question is, well, what's causing this? Uh, and the answer is it could be many things. Um, and, uh, but the important thing is to, is to, that people are thinking about this uh, and not just kind of um, presuming that they know what's going on. Uh, and so in no particular order, some of the more common things that can contribute to this are um, whether there's a co-occurring or comorbid psychiatric problem, so like anxiety or ADHD or depression or something else. Um, certainly also, uh, you know, what is the behavioral function of that behavior and how is it being reinforced and are there skill deficits that, that relate to this? Uh, so this is really the area of, of that, that's assessed and treated through ABA. Um, other areas, very important areas, communication, of course, uh, challenges. There could be family changes that are, are related to this, sensory issues, mismatch between abilities and demands, either asking too much of someone or too little, um, side effects of, of medications or other interventions, um, and a host of other, of other reasons. Um, so the the etiology, potential etiology is, is wide um, and of course can include multiple of these things. Uh, and so I think that's um, something just important that the concept here is that a, the behavior, the aggression or self-injury is a, a outcome, but what is leading to it? What is the pathway that's leading to that? Either in the moment or over time. So just to look at a couple of those, of the, the big ones for a second. Um, so psychiatric comorbidity. So this is the co-occurrence of other diagnosable psychiatric issues in addition to the autism. Um, and so I won't get into the detail here, but just to say that this was a, a, a nice study, looked at about 110 children. Um, and this is what this study found is, um, anxiety, 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 followed by ADHD, followed by mood issues such as depression, and then uh, followed by things that are uh, more rare, such as bipolar disorder or a psychotic disorder. Um, and in this sample, no one had a psychotic disorder, but it does occur at, a, at, at very small percentages. So, and this um, is the same, uh, just the, in these broad categories, as um, children who don't have autism, this is actually the breakdown of, of psychiatric disorders in all children, which is anxiety is the most common, followed by ADHD, followed by mood, and then followed by more uh, rare or less common disorders like bipolar or psychosis. Um, so that's, that's psychiatric comorbidity. In terms of um, the assessment of challenging behaviors and, and the, the science of ABA uh, for problem behaviors, um, the question is, how do we make sense of this challenging behavior? Look, how do we um, understand why this is happening and what's maintaining it uh, would be the behavioral approach. Um, and so the big question there, um, to put this field you know, very simply is what is the function of that behavior? That is, what is he or she getting by engaging in the behavior? What is reinforcing the behavior? What is the outcome of, of the behavior? Um, and there are four primary functions of, of challenging behavior, uh, and a behavior could have one or more of these functions. Um, so the first is to gain social attention, Second, access to something preferred, uh, i.e. getting something you desire. And that uh, uh, the third is escaping or avoiding something that's not preferred. Uh, and the fourth is called automatic reinforcement, which you can think of as, as it's a behavior that is, is internally driven. It's often self-stimulatory. There are other functions. Uh, and as I said, a behavior can have multiple functions, but this is the, the, the basic breakdown. 
Also a big area, of course, is medical issues and could that relate to the challenging behavior that we're seeing? Um, and so just to list common medical issues in youth with autism, seizures, GI problems, of course, are big, primarily constipation, uh, encoparesis, and GERD, uh, which is acid reflux. Uh, but we also see dental problems, sleep problems are, are very prevalent, um, and some allergies, and then things that are common to kids generally, minor injuries, ear infections, headaches, all um, things to consider. So when we think about that, that large etiology or, or potential contributors to this challenging behavior, um, then our approaches for addressing it um, follow those different uh, potential uh, uh, causes or etiologies. So, you know, so as I already said, applied behavior analysis would be the behavioral approach um, to try to address function and reinforcement uh, and consequences and skill deficits. Um, communication strategies, of which I listed a couple here, um, AAC or functional communication or visual supports to try to assist with communication or improving communication. Um, for those where their social cognitive or social communication issues are relating to the challenging behavior. There are approaches for that. Certainly we wanna assess and try to treat psychiatric comorbidity. Um, there are also psychotherapy approaches for um, uh, some challenges, including anxiety and anger management. Uh, and there are sensory regulatory strategies, as, as people likely know. Um, we certainly want to assess and treat any medical problems that are going on. And then, of course, there's working with the family to address any, try to address issues in the family that could relate, be relating to what's going on. And there are also evidence-based um, uh, trainings uh, for parents or caregivers, uh, one of which I highlighted here because it has good evidence called, uh, it's called either PMT, Parent Management Training, or Ruby. Um, so these are just some of the more common uh, and, and many of them evidence-based approaches for addressing challenging behaviors. But of course, which ones you select or use is gonna be driven by ideally what you've assessed the etiology to be, and of course, in reality, also what's available to you um, locally. Uh, so now let's, so we talked about beha behavior and how we think about it and kind of this multiple etiology approach. And so now let's talk about psychiatric hospitalization, where I'm going to illustrate for you um, in the right program, psychiatric hospitalization is a terrific way, uh, not that we want anyone to be hospitalized, but, but in terms of marshalling resources and being able to really tackle a problem, a psychiatric hospitalization can be an excellent way to, to go after all these etiologies and, and, and improve things for an individual and a family if things have risen to the level of a psychiatric hospitalization. So we're gonna go into that. So first of all, um, huge issue in our country is people with autism or intellectual disability ending up in the emergency room because of a behavioral crisis and then getting stuck there for days, weeks, or longer. Um, and there's been studies on this. And so a study of a Massachusetts emergency room actually showed that the number one reason, number one predictor of being stuck in the emergency room uh, was having autism. And the number two predictor was if you had intellectual disability, which is quite remarkable. It wasn't uh, something else, schizophrenia or homelessness or whatever it was, if you had either autism or intellectual disability. And when I say stuck, the technical term for that is boarding. Boarding means you're in an emergency room waiting for a psychiatric hospital bed. That's what boarding means. So, so big problem. And our population is, is the ones who are perhaps most affected by this. Um, so, uh, leave that there. Um, so something uh, that is not particularly well known is that it has been shown um, that youth with autism do have very high rates of psychiatric hospitalization. Um, so one study showed 11% of 
kids by the time they reached age 21 had been psychiatrically hospitalized. I know that may look like a small number, but that's a, a very large number in that it's something like 0.05% of the general population of kids have been psychiatrically hospitalized by the time they're age 21. So this is many times uh, greater. Another study also illustrated this um, where they looked at 33,000 kids um, with autism, and then they looked at um, a population who didn't have autism all in the same uh, health system, and they found that the kids with autism were being psychiatrically hospitalized six times more frequently than those without autism. So it is quite common, or, or there are high rates of hospitalization. Um, and uh, and yet, I'm also going to tell you uh, uh, something that may give you a cognitive dissonance, which is um, it is as much as it's common, it's also can be incredibly hard to hospitalize a person, psychiatrically hospitalize a person with autism, um, because there are for a whole number of reasons, among which are there's a very limited number of specialty units. Uh, designed for the population, which I'm going to tell you more about. There's also a geographic maldistribution of those units in the U.S. with them clustered really on the East Coast and then a little bit in the Midwest and all very little availability in, in the West of the United States. Um, almost all these units are for youth. There's vanishingly few for adults. There's one in Pittsburgh, there's one in Michigan. Uh, there might be a few others, but very few for adults. Um, and then just generally, I, I would propose, I've seen that, you know, there is a lack of knowledge, expertise, relevant treatment approaches in many general psychiatric units, because it's really not what they're designed for. And so, um, so that obviously is a barrier to admission or being served uh, in a psychiatric hospital. There are some other barriers that people may not know about. There are insur insurance rules, health insurance rules in some states that require that you have a what they consider to be a primary psychiatric diagnosis to be admitted to a psych hospital and, and have it paid for. And even though ASD is in the DSM and, and is, is clearly a uh, you know, like it or not, uh, it's it's clearly defined as a psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Um, these insurance companies try to separate it out and say it's not a valid reason for admission. So that's a whole issue in certain states. And finally, there's um, uh, sometimes a denial by insurance companies of care because they don't understand autism. And, and to put that simply, they will say, well, you know, all people with autism are aggressive. So, you know, why we're not going to pay for this admission or something like that. And um, of course, that is very much not the case, because if you look at the criteria, diagnostic criteria for autism, it doesn't say anything about self-injury, property destruction, aggression, et cetera. So these things are not part of autism. They are they happen in people with autism, but they're not just part of autism. So. Um, so lots of barriers. Um, however, people do end up getting hospitalized. Um, and so there's some known about what is the risk for hospitalization. Uh, um, so uh, this is one study that showed not surprisingly aggressive behavior is the biggest risk factor, but there were some other interesting risk factors. Um, it happened to be that that in this study that if a child was from a single parent home, they had a higher risk, uh, if they had diagnosed depression or OCD, and if they had self-injurious behavior. Um, another study looking at risk factors for hospitalization, um, uh, which was a, a larger study, showed that if the child had lower adaptive functioning, they had more severe ASD symptoms, uh, they, uh, this study did also find, again, single uh, caregiver uh, in the home um, and presence of a mood disorder or sleep problems, all of which independently increased the risk of psychiatric hospitalization. And I thought the sleep problem piece was particularly notable. So, uh, so we did a study a while ago looking at, well, why do kids with autism come to a psychiatric hospital? Um, and, and so this is the pie chart showing what was the chief complaint. In other words, the primary reason they came. They may have multiple of these, but what's the primary reason this child's being admitted to a psychiatric hospital? And this was the answer. So not surprisingly, it's externalizing behaviors. So aggression, self-injury, 
property destruction is the bulk of it. And then uh, a few other things, you know, tantrum, sexualized behavior, elopement, or just generally decreased functioning, which would not be a externalizing behavior. So this um, we thought was important to study and show because the important thing is, is these are not the reasons that most other people in the psychiatric hospital are being hospitalized. Um, they're being hospitalized uh, because typically they have um, a, a very impairing uh, symptoms from a psychiatric disorder, in, uh, such as they're terribly depressed, or, or they have incredibly impairing OCD and they can't function, or they have a psychotic illness. And the person with autism might have those things, but what's being expressed are typically are these challenging behaviors, and that's why they're being admitted to the hospital. And so, so you've got internalizing and other disorders happening mostly on in the rest of the hospital, and then for your people with autism, you've got these challenging behaviors. And so we have to be honest about that and say, okay, so they're coming with a different, usually a different set of, of behaviors in, and therefore they have different needs. So they need a different program than what was typically offered in a psychiatric hospital. And so I'm gonna try to display that to you a little bit. And I, I realize I'm talking, just to make points, I'm talking very broad strokes. Of course, this doesn't fit every person with autism or not autism who comes to a psych hospital, but I'm telling you kind of the general things that, that we see and have been shown. Um, so if you look on the left, these are common elements of typical psychiatric units. They were developed for internalizing, as I said, uh, slash psychiatric problems like severe depression. They rely on verbal intervention. So what's the intervention on a psych unit beyond medication? It's talking, talking with staff, discussing events, doing therapy, having family meetings. So it's a lot of talk. Uh, they have group programming, which by definition has high social interaction demands. There's lots of staff transitions. Um, and if there is a reinforcement system, it is typically a very general reinforcement system, like you earn levels and the reinforcer might be something once a day. Okay, so on the right hand side is, is some of my thoughts about people with autism, you know, coming to a psych hospital. So, so as opposed to on the left side, uh, as I've said, we people with autism or ID primarily are coming because they have externalizing behavioral symptoms. Um, they uh, obviously may struggle with a highly verbal milieu or, or treatment approach, um, or it may be entirely inappropriate. Um, uh, participating in groups obviously can be a big challenge. Um, they are, by definition, they've been removed from their preferred routines and a population that generally thrives on consistency is suddenly in a place that's very inconsistent. Um, and the reinforcement point. So many of our individuals with autism are used to a much higher frequency of reinforcement and very specific reinforcement. Uh, uh, and so earning hospital privileges is of no interest and not relevant uh, too many of them, and so is not effective. Uh, and so the result of that, is, of all this, it can be that someone with autism in a psych hospital where they're not doing these things or, or they're doing their typical things can end up agitated, excluded, not reinforced, and then that can lead to more challenging behavior and, and other problems. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about now specialized uh, psychiatric hospital units. I'm going to use the one that we run at Spring Harbor Hospital as the example of this. Uh, not that we're the best or anything like that, but just that's what I have access to, obviously. Um, so we have a, a large continuum of care, which is what um, these words are showing. But the, the, the sort of most intensive uh, level of care that we have is at the top. It's it's so Spring Arbor Hospital, where we have a developmental, we call it a developmental disorders unit. And you can only be admitted to this unit. It's for youth if, if you have autism or uh, intellectual disability, essentially, or both. And that's, that's a entry criteria. Um, and so it's a specialty unit. This is the hospital on the left. Uh, and that's our outpatient center on the right. 
Um, so our philosophy for kids and families, you know, coming to this unit is that we can use the inpatient hospitalization to stabilize things. And of that large list of what could be driving these behaviors, we can assess and pick out what are the key pieces, or, or we try to, uh, of both kind of the acute crisis and also there's often been a chronic crisis going on um, that families have been living with. And so hospitalization is a great opportunity for, you know, intensive assessment and treatment of challenging behaviors and teaching new skills and trying to set people up for success. Uh, and our other tenet is that we need to be rigorous in trying to diagnose and treat psychiatric comorbidity, um, which often ends up in reducing the number of meds somebody's on. And so we do that with a pretty large multidisciplinary team in this inpatient unit. Uh, and so our team includes child psychiatry, a behavioral psychologist, uh, BCBA, special education, speech, OT, nursing, social work, and a milieu coordinator. And so just to point out, when you go on other psychiatric units in our hospital or at, or in many others in the country, you're you will you, you, the typical team is a psychiatrist, a social worker, and nursing. Um, so everyone else here, you would not typically see on an inpatient team. So we've added multiple other disciplines and roles um, because that's what we think it takes to treat this population um, uh, adequately. So the foundation of our treatment is uh, uh, a behavior plan um, that, that is developed carefully, uh, as well as tar targeted psychopharmacology, and then trying to transfer skills to everyone in the child's life. Um, so in order to display, so that's a, so it's a big complicated intervention to try to display it rapidly. I'm going to use a case example that'll give you just a sense of, of, of how we do this, the work we do. Um, and, and I think is a good, ex somewhat of an example of, of how other specialized inpatient units work around the country. So a six-year-old girl with autism uh, who has mild intellectual disability uh, in addition. Um, and so she came to the hospital because she was having frequent tantrums, uh, adding up to up to two hours a day. And during those tantrums, she was having physical aggression toward other people, maybe 20 to 40 instances of aggression a day. Um, she is uh, nonverbal, which by one definition, less than 10 single words. Um, she uses PECs at school, not at home, which is a, a communication system. Um, she had some challenges with both her gross and fine motor skills. Uh, she was at about the pre-K level for education, but with some, some variability. Um, physiologically, she was having a lot of sleep problems. She was awakening three to four times a night. Um, and this is the medication she came in on, risperidone, four milligrams, which is a, a very hefty dose, particularly for a six-year-old. And some, some Benadryl is needed. And suffice it to say, this isn't working. Uh, none of this is working because she's coming into the hospital with this picture. So that's our assumption is this isn't working well. Um, and so we start observing, observing, and take a long history. Uh, and so this is what we see in the first couple days. Uh, we see a child who's tired and sedated because she's not sleeping, and she's on four milligrams of risperidone, so she's both tired and sedated, uh, and neither of those things are good. Um, she is very frustrated with her ability to communicate her wants and needs. Uh, despite the reports, um, she is not facile with PECs and really not able to spontaneously get her needs and wants met. Um, she's also confused and disoriented because she doesn't have what one might say is good autism practice, i.e. she doesn't have a schedule and supports around her to increase predictability. Um, She's had a lot of inconsistent expectations um, and she was very cute. So even with our staff, she, she generated some inconsistent expectations, which is you know good for her, but not so good. Um, the FBA we did showed you know, primarily an attention function with some escape as well for these episodes of screaming and aggression. Um, and also, this is not so common, but we noted that she actually wasn't eating very efficiently because she had some fine motor deficits, so she was kind of hungry. 
Uh, so this was kind of what our assessment showed initially. Um, and so based on that assumption assessment, here's what we did um, over about 40 days. So here's the problem, tantrums that occur and don't occur with aggression. And so we went after these different areas. So communication, we worked on her PEX usage and, and helped her to become more facile with that. Um, and we did this in the hospital uh, and then worked with parents and, and the in-home providers on that. Um, we of course worked on the behavior um, and we, so first of all, we stopped the medications that won't, weren't working, developed a behavior plan. Um, and I believe she did not go on a further medication uh, for this girl. Um, those are certainly sometimes we, we do use medication, certainly. Um, we worked on her sleep. Um, so we did good sleep hygiene, uh, and that often is very helpful for her. She continued to have sleep problems, and so we did use a sleep medicine that got her sleeping, but we also did go over sleep hygiene with the parents so they could bring that piece home. Um, uh, and then um, we did what I referred to in shorthand as good autism practice. We structured her environment in the ways you see here. And finally, we did work on an eating protocol with her because she had that particular problem. And so the the this is her uh, aggression data. So this is frequency data. So in this inpatient hospital program, we we take data 24 seven on the target behaviors. And this is what her uh, aggression looked like. So she came in with, you know, 40 to 70 uh, aggressive acts a day. And this is what happened over the course of about 40 days. And so just a couple things to note with this. Um, so, you know, this is um, very successful, uh, but a couple things to note, um, lots of variability day to day, which means you should not react to each day. Uh, and that's something we work on as a treatment team is really what happened yesterday. It doesn't have a lot of meaning until it persists over time. So trying to not make med changes, not react to just the last 24 hours is an important element because you will end up chasing your tail. Because as you can see, there's a lot of variability day to day, but what matters is the change over time. The other thing I think that's notable is success is not zero at a hot, from a hospital perspective. I mean, of course we'd love behaviors to go to zero, but that's not um, realistic and it's not the function of the hospital. I think the function of the hospital is to get things on the right track and then move back to outpatient. Because if we, you know, we have diminishing returns. So if, the, if we waited until everything was at zero, instead of a 40 day stay, it could be, you know, a six month stay. And I, and that would not be a good use of the hospital resources. This is her emotion dysregulation graph. So that's tantrums and not surprisingly, it follows basically the, the aggression graph because uh, those two were paired together mostly for her. Um, so that was looking at one individual child. We also published a study where I think we, we uh, followed 38 children, um, some who had autism, some who had non-autism intellectual disability. Uh, and I know this is a complicated figure, but basically what it showed is um, this is a measure of aggression, self-injury, and tantrums. And so it showed for this group of children that uh, they came in with a high score, which means a lot of aggression, self-injury, and tantrums. They discharged with a very low score because clinical on this scale is usually about a 14 to 18. So they are essentially non-clinical level uh, when they discharge. And, um, and that is great. And one hopes that that's the case because we're obviously investing a lot of time, energy, and money in helping these children. Um, but what we didn't know at all is what did they look like two months later? And so we reassessed them two months later after discharge. So they're back at home or in a group home, they're back in their, you know, we have no further contact with them. And we were pretty happy to see that these gains are sustaining fairly well um, two months out. So that was, uh, I think, very encouraging. Um, so we're getting a little short on time, so I'm going to uh, uh, skip this part, I think, and um, instead I'm going to tell you just a little bit about um, 
uh, uh, this study, and then we'll go to questions. Um, so, so, so I was telling you about these specialized hospital units, and I used our unit as an example, and then I showed you some other data. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about is, um, so it's terrific that we can have some of these units, I think, and that that we can have success with a lot of the people who come into these units, but there's, and the number of units is growing. When we did that initial study in 2011, we could only find nine. There's now probably about 18 to 20 of these in the United States. And so it seems to be a growing thing, which is, is good. However, I don't know if they'll ever be enough. And so another question is how do we improve care you know, beyond these units for all people uh, with autism who are coming into psychiatric hospitals. And so rather another approach is in addition to having very specialized units um, that are high expertise, but high cost, obviously, and not very, not available, not greatly available. The other way to do it is to improve the care for people with autism in regular or general psychiatric units of which there are many in the country and uh and so uh one way to do that within medicine is to develop a, a care pathway and so that's something we did uh in partnership with uh we we formed a partnership with bellevue hospital in lower manhattan which is a academic public uh psychiatric hospital not a high resource setting um and together we developed a pathway and the idea was what 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 is doable in a regular unit where you don't have necessarily extra expertise or staffing what can you do to make the admission more effective and better for people with autism and so we we developed a pathway and then we studied it for 18 months before it was implemented and then 18 months after it was implemented so i'm going to tell you the basics of that pathway and the outcomes and then we'll go to questions so the basics so there were six basic pieces pieces of this pathway that we developed so when when a child with autism was admitted into this unit they went on this autism or id they went onto this pathway and the pathway was just to get some additional information at admission to try to address the basics for the child i'm going to explain this in a second support predictability have a very basic behavior plan, but at least have a plan, have some concrete coping strategies, and also try to support their communication. So the way we did this was, this was number one, collect additional information at admissions. We, we developed this tip sheet, we being us and the team at, at Bellevue, NYU Bellevue. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty basic. How does the child communicate? What do they understand? What are the warning signs for their behavior? Uh, what do they like to be rewarded with? Um, so very basic information, but this isn't the kind of information that is always or typically collected in a typical psychiatric admission necessarily. Um, so collecting additional information, then just training staff to really address the basics, you know, toileting, sleeping, eating, drinking. Um, then we provided some training and tools to support predictability, so schedules, visual schedules, um, <clears throat> provided a template for a very basic behavior plan, but with a higher frequency of reward and a more specific reward than, as I said, units typically do um, when they have level systems or point systems. We then also provided, I don't have time to go into all this, but provided um, some very, as I said, most psychiatric units, the main intervention is talking. Let's debrief, let's talk about this, let's do psychotherapy, et cetera. And for a lot of our population, that isn't really a productive approach necessarily, at least for, for kind of acute agitation. And so what we emphasize with the staff and trained them in and gave them this tool is we need to use a really concrete uh, coping strategies or de-escalation strategies. And so you see some of them displayed there, such as going for a walk or taking space or taking deep breaths. An option is to talk with staff if it's a person who's more verbal, but there are lots of not verbally dependent options here. And finally, as I said, just enhancing communication. 
So we developed that pathway. We measured for 18 months before we implemented it. We implemented it, and then we measured for 18 months afterward. And in brief, the outcome of implementing what was a pretty basic pathway was that their average stay decreased by 40%. In other words, they were able to get kids out the bat, out the door much faster, uh, and that that's a big deal. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps even more of a big deal is the use of physical management. So holds or restraints decreased by almost 80% in the post period. So in other words, so I would interpret that as the tools they had and the pathway they were on, they were better able to manage the children without using physical or with using less of the physical interventions and or the children were doing better and didn't need them uh, either way or probably both. So a pretty, I think we thought a pretty successful uh, intervention. So I'm gonna skip this so we can go to questions and just say in summary, um, youth with autism can develop serious emotional and behavioral challenges and that puts them at risk for a whole bunch of other problems, including that developmental trajectory bending downward. Um, and something I'm trying to display to you folks is that often, not always, but often the work of a single discipline is not enough because the problem is multifactorial or has multiple etiologies. So when they hit this level where they need hospitalization, they having excellent ABA isn't enough usually, or having excellent medication management isn't enough. You need usually more than one discipline of provider. And finally, well, and, and so uh, the last thing is what I just said verbally, that you need really a multidisciplinary approach often uh, to, to overcome these challenges. So thank you. Uh, uh, some resources, um, so available for free uh, download at this website, which is for the American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry. There is a parent medication guide for autism, and the and I was involved in developing this. Uh, and the thing I like about it is, yes, it talks about medications, but actually, almost half of it talks about everything that should happen before medication and and thinking about all these different disciplines. So so a good resource, I think, and it's available for free. Uh, and then these are a couple more academic publications um, regarding psychiatric hospitalization and kind of acute management. And finally, and I know that was fast, but the slides will be available. I just wanna acknowledge that some of the research that I displayed was done um, by, by uh, our group here and, and I have co-investigators at other um, uh, institutions who, are, who, you know, who are part of those studies, as well as people here uh, at our institution, and you know, several sources of funding for that research. So, thank you very much, and we can go to questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. Um, just following the Q and A throughout this, before we we have time for a couple questions, but just wanted to echo what I'm seeing in. Q&A is that a lot of people are just really thanking you and your team for all this, this wonderful work that you do. And I, I, I do echo that, um, their, their thanks. Uh, so like I said, we have a couple minutes, maybe we can get to like two or three questions. One question I've seen quite, quite a few people asking both here on Zoom and on Facebook is, is there a list anywhere that, that lives somewhere on the internet of, of these specialized units around the country that people could, can see? Ah, so uh, thank you. We get that question all the time. Uh, and um, uh, the answer is yes and no, and it's embarrassing, frankly. Uh, uh, so there is a bit of a list on the website for our research collaborative. Um, and and um, I believe by memory that that website is um, www.mmcri dot org backslash ADIRC, so A-D-D-I-R-C, um, and I hope I got that right. Uh, however, or in addition, but we're aware that this is a, 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 an obvious need, and so um, we actually have a new collaborative we're forming that is not about research, but it's about performance improvement for these inpatient units, and we are just finishing the website now, and so we are going to put 
a much a more extensive list of all the units that we're aware of uh, on that website. Um, so that's coming, but it isn't there yet. And then I also know that the NCSA, National Council on Severe Autism, uh, which is an advocacy and resource group, is trying to put together their own list. So that's the long answer. Um, but yes, it's an obvious, it's a big need. Um, and then can you just repeat that, the uh, the MM? Yes, CRI, yes. I, I yeah. believe it's www.mmcri.org backslash ADIRC. So it's E-D-D-I-R-C. Great. And we can, um, for, for those attendees that are interested in that, that site, we can also make that available as a resource on the webinar page on spark uh, sparkforautism.org when we when we post this. So you'll have that there. Um, great. And then one other question, you, you spoke a bit about, you know, the challenges with working with the insurance companies. Mm. Uh, but in addition to that, we had some people expressing, um, you know, their challenge working with the providers before they even get to the insurance companies of that, you know, say that the behaviors perhaps are autism related and not psychiatric in nature. Do you have any advice for, for parents that are, that are struggling with this challenge with their providers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that definitely, uh, of course is an issue. Uh, a couple thoughts. Uh, one is, I think it's fair to make the point that, that I made, uh, not, not in a, a oppositional way, but just in a, kind of educational way that, well, okay, but let's look at the diagnostic criteria of autism. I don't see aggression there. I don't see self-injury. I don't see tantrums. I don't see property destruction. So this is not part of the autism. This is a symptom of problems. Uh, and so we need to try to assess and treat those problems. So I think you can make that point uh, uh, to the provider. Um, if they really just don't feel they can pursue it or don't want to pursue it, um, then maybe you you need to try to find a different provider, which I know is easy to say and not easy to do. But um, uh, it, it really it isn't. There's nothing normal about a child with autism or any other child hitting themselves or hitting someone else or having massive tantrums or putting holes in the wall. Like that's not acceptable. Uh, uh, it's not good for the child or, or adult or anyone around them. And so we can't just write that off as that's the way it is for people in this population. Um, so that's my answer. Great. Um, and then I guess we probably can maybe squeeze in in one more, one more quick question, perhaps. Um, so obviously in, in these programs, it's important to, you know, figure out the um, the appropriate programming needs for, for patients. So what that multidisciplinary team might look like. Um, and I think this question is coming uh, more from another another researcher, but how is your how is your facility able to provide these teams and fund fund such teams? Right. Right. So like many things, it gets down to money. Uh, and and uh, so we should be clear about that. I mean, running this, this, this unit is higher cost than your typical unit. You've got a higher staffing ratio and you've got a bigger clinical team. Um, and so we and many of the other specialized units around the country have been able to work with uh, primarily their, their state Medicaid uh, uh, officials to get a higher reimbursement rate for this care. And the argument is um, that you're going to, they're going to spend the money anyway. They can spend it on lots of emergency room visits and maybe not very successful general psychiatric admissions, or they can spend it on what I think we have some evidence to show can be a more effective, um, but more, more expensive, but more effective, um, uh, stay in a specialized unit. So the short answer is you have to negotiate a better reimbursement rate with your state Medicaid officials and also with commercial insurance. And we've, we, we and many others have been successful with that. So when commercial insurance, I mean like Blue Cross or United or something like that. Um, but you can't get around it. This, is, this costs more money to do. Um, uh, but the outcomes are, I think we've shown the outcomes are better. 
Great. And then just, I know I said that was last one, but another question I am looking back at quite a lot of kind of goes back a little bit adjacent to our first question is, are you aware of any facilities, uh, any uh, uh, for, for adults similar um, throughout the country? And if there's a similar resource page you're aware of for that? So we are going to include uh, units that serve adults in our, in the resource page we're developing for our, for this performance. This is new collaborative. It's not up yet. Um, this performance improvement collaborative, but the quick answer is, unfortunately, this is a, a huge problem. There are off the top of my head, three or four adult units in the entire country. Uh, and off the top of my head, they are, there's one in Pittsburgh, uh, at Western Psychiatric Institute, and there is uh, one in Michigan that's sta state operated. And there, there may be a couple others. Uh, I certainly don't claim to know, you know, all of them, but, but they're vanishingly few. Um, and I don't see a big movement toward building more, whereas I am seeing that with youth. So, and actually there's one in New York um, uh, at a hospital um, in, in the greater New York City area uh, for adults, um, I just remembered. But yes, not very many, but we will include them in the list we're gonna develop. 